architecture firms often stay away from retainers. They often um, are not tracking their marketing time and they often shy away from billing their services when they're providing free services. And the client knows he's not gonna be, get charged, but the client doesn't know what the value of that free charge was. Was it a $200 worth of service or was it a $2,000 worth of service that was provided free? Let the client know what it was uh, by sending that $0 invoice at the end. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, I'm Enix Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Now, let's get down to business. Today is the second half of my interview with the founder and CEO of BQE Software. They're the makers of Bill Quick and Archie Office. Shafat Kazi, he's developed his first business software at the age of 22. He has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to best business practices for architecture firms. So it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show, Shafat Kazi. So in our pre-interview, we talked about, you have some suggestions. You have you know brainstormed and you have some thoughts on uh, best practices for architecture firms, in addition to what we talked about before, to help them increase their revenue, be more competitive, and really thrive in the in the in the future. So, uh, and this goes actually for um, architects as well as engineers, um, as well as other professional service firms. These are some of the new things that we believe. Uh, will make a big difference. So one of the things that I um, am a true believer in that will actually change the world of accounting and the business management um, is a term called project accounting. Project accounting has been out forever, but it was tedious. It meant more data entry. It was time consuming and businesses simply could not afford that kind of time to do project accounting. But today, with the computing power that we have and products like BillQuick that do project accounting, you know, uh, as a built-in feature with minimum input from the user, what it does to the business um, is the ability for them to convert every project into a profit center and also convert every project manager into a business manager. So what you're now doing is instead of getting that profit and loss report or income expense report quarterly or annually, you're now getting the P&L of your projects. So every project becomes a mini business within your business. And every project manager becomes a business owner of that small business. And they feel more responsible. And in many cases, they're happier because they feel they're contributing towards the growth of the company. So, so uh, one of the advices to every architect and engineer is, if you haven't implemented project accounting, start looking into it and start implementing it. Trust me, it's not anything extra. The biggest difference is that your project manager now is responsible, not just for the timely delivery of the product or the project, but also uh, responsible for the business aspect of the project, which means that the project costs have to be lower than the project income. And he or she should have the visibility into that data to be able to control it. And they should be having technologies that make them proactive rather than reactive. So they should not be waiting for a report to arrive. And by the time the report arrives, the water's over the bridge. And they're like saying, oh, my God, you know, we spent so much time on it. We, we already over the budget. So what do we do now? Um, so controlling those things, giving them the tools to manage their projects better and then understanding project accounting, coaching them about what project accounting means. And more importantly, tie their bonuses, try their raises to their performance of their projects because project accounting will let you do that. It'll show you which project managers projects are making how much profit in terms of dollars as well as percentage uh, of the overall contribution to the profit of the company. So now you know who your brain makers are and you also know who your bottlenecks are. So you, you can work with the bottlenecks and try to make them the rainmakers and you can reward the rainmakers by uh, uh, you know, tying their bonus to the overall profit that their projects make. Um, so that's one aspect that I believe that uh, businesses that have started implementing it are reporting back saying, oh my God, what a difference. 
So we are no longer hearing about the loss at the end of the quarter. We're now watching for these wins and losses on project by project basis. And it's, it's, it mushrooms up. And if projects are profitable, therefore the company is profitable. You had a great experience that you shared with me about going into a company and, and uh, you, you told me how you like to go in there just for a day and the deal is that you get to go where you want to go and you just look over their shoulder and uh, you discovered something interesting about their favorite client. Yes, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was a company in Canada and I spent a day uh, in that company looking at their usage of our products. Uh, how they were implementing. I sat with the billing person. I sat with the office manager. I sat with the project managers. I looked at their data file, company file, and analyzed their invoices and their payments and their clients and their billings, you know, their average rate, their realization. Everything that I uh, knew mattered as the key performance indicators of the company. Now, towards the end of the day, um, I had the meeting with the principals of the company, and there were three principals of the company. And and I asked them a question. I said, who is your best client? And unanimously, all three of them named a particular client, you know, let's say ABC company. They said, ABC company is our best client. And I asked each person separately. I said, why do you think they're the best client? And they all gave me the same answer. Look at the number of projects this client brings us. Look at the overall invoicing we do and billing we do to this client. And they're about 30 to 40% of our overall revenue. They are the most important client that we have. And, and I took a pause and looked them in the eye and I said, what if I tell you that ABC company is your worst client and you should fire that client? And they were all looking at me like, you know, I'm drugged or I'm smoking some dope. And then I shared the data with them. I said, I looked at your company file and it appears that the realization rate, average realization rate for your employees with that client is somewhere between 20 to $35. So you, that client is giving you a lot of projects, that's true, but the fee structure that you have with that client is making you work at a very low rate. In many cases, you're actually working below your cost for that client on an average. And he's keeping you so busy that's preventing you from getting and working on the profitable projects. So as an example, they had started going into these, uh, doing these schools. Um, and I looked at four or five school projects they had done that year, and the realization rate that in, the, in those projects were around $200 an hour. So I said, look at this school project. Your employees got paid average $200 an hour working on that project, while as the same employee when they worked on the ABC client got paid much lower, around $30 or $32 an hour. So, so what I would encourage you is don't fire your ABC client right now, but start marketing and seeking out these types of projects that Bill Quick tells you that you get a better realization rate and more profits so that you have enough work in those areas to let go this client. And trust me, you don't need to get 40% more projects. You only need to get 10% more projects to compensate for this 40% because this client's not paying you well anyway. Um, and three years later, um, I followed up and, um, and I was told that they tripled their revenue and that ABC client now is less than 5% of their billing. So, so the lesson learned there was that there is a perception that every business owner has about their business and their clients. And often that perception is right, but in many cases that perception is totally off. They are wasting their time on the wrong type of projects or investing in the wrong clients. And that's where the intelligence of technology and software comes in and it teaches you, says, hey, wait a minute, you are losing money working with this client, even though you feel like there's a lot of billing happening, but that billing is actually keeping you from doing real work where you would make profit. So that was the lesson learned and they learned it. And, and that's something that I truly believe in and I, use it for my own business too. It's the data that constantly asks me to adjust my course of my business because we see where, you know, where something pays off and where it doesn't. And you mentioned yesterday on ROI, and that's what it is at the end of the day. ROI doesn't really stop at the marketing. Return on investment 
has to go on into the life of the project because you are investing your employees time who you are paying salaries and perks and benefits you're investing that in your client and if your client doesn't pay you that back then you are not getting an ROI and and the question is what should be your ROI you know should it be twice that or 1.5 times that that's something that you have to determine but don't make a mistake in understanding your true costs because the true costs in USA as an example range from 2.5 to 3.5 times the salary that you pay an employee so if you're paying somebody $40 an hour that employee is costing company anywhere between 80 to 120 dollars an hour because of the cost of doing business the insurance the rent the phone system the the uh, the bonuses and and everything else uh, the travel uh, marketing everything else that we do that we often uh, tend to miss on and and something uh, like one of our products will give you that number in real time tell you what that order factor is so that you know that if you're not making that much money per hour with that employee that you're losing money so don't don't ever look at their salary rate that's the biggest mistake you're going to make always multiply the salary by the known overhead factor to understand the true cost or true investment and then then focus on your ROI based on that you you mentioned realization rate tell our audience what is what do you mean by real what is realization rate <laughs> A uh, realization rate, or or uh, also known as effective bill rate, um, that's something that is another important thing. I want to go back and give you a little bit on a couple of things there. One is um, one is the term called overhead factor. So a lot of companies would hire CPAs to figure out the overhead factor for their business. Um, don't need to do that. I'll give you a simple formula. Take your accounting software, go into your accounting software and run your expenses for last 12 months. And then pull out the payroll for the last 12 months. I'm talking about direct payroll, not, not any benefits and everything else, just the payroll. So hypothetically saying, let's say your expenses for last 12 months were million dollars and your payrolls $400,000. Then your overhead factor is 2.5. So what that means is for every dollar you pay an employee, it actually costs you two and a half dollars to, to keep the business running. So understand that your cost is not a dollar, it's, it's a two and a half dollars uh, in that case. So that's a simple way of calculating over factor. Now, if you hire a person and uh, hypothetically saying, let's say you are hiring a drafting person and you plan to build that drafting person at hundred dollars an hour and you already know that your order factor is 2.5 so you can now do the reverse calculation and say okay if my order factor is 2.5 I'm going to hire a drafting person for hundred dollars an hour that's what I'm gonna bill him at therefore I can't pay anything more than forty dollars an hour that's my peak on my salary and at that point by the way at forty dollars an hour you're making zero profit very important so what you probably want to do is either increase his bill rate so that you can make some profit or understand that you know that 40 may be too much 35 may be more appropriate so so the employee needs to know that his salary is re related to the capability of the company billing now comes the term effective bill rate or realization rate so it's a very simple way to get that rate what you do is you look at the total revenue made by an employee due to his contribution towards a project whether it's a fixed fee project or an hourly project. It's a very complex formula for fixed fee projects, but something like Bill Quick or Archie Office, they calculate it instantly for you all the time. So you look at the total revenue made by that employee and you divide it by the total hours employee worked, let's say 2,080 hours, including, of course, the days off that employee took because you pay the salary anyway while they are on vacation, right? So... So there's 2,080 hours in a year. You made half a million dollars from that employee. You take that half a million dollars, you divide it by 2,080, you get what we call as the effective bill rate or the realization rate for your employee. That realization better be higher than your pay rate times your overhead multiplier. 
if it's not higher than your pay rate times over a multiplier, you know you are not making money off of that employee. So you have two options to either look at why the realization rate is diluted, uh, which could be that the employee is spending too much time on the task that you can't really bill that much, you're tied to a fixed fee, or it could simply be that the employees doing too much of the overhead activities that, um, that are not necessarily beneficial to the company. Or it could simply be that you're billing the employee under the, the rate that you should be, and you need to increase the bill rate to, to really make it profitable for, for the company to have that, have that person. And that goes in, so that kind of ties into you have a simple calculation for it. Because a question I get a lot is how sh- how much should I bill out my my employee as? So you kind of you kind of answered it there, um, but let's dive into that a little bit because sometimes people don't necessarily know how much you know where the numbers are. It really is a numbers game, you know. And people sometimes yes. they don't they don't know how much they're paying their their employees. They're not exactly sure how much profit they're bringing in. So take us through that exercise of just let's kind of restate that again from the other way. If you have a new employee and you want to figure out what you want to bill this person out as, how do I approach that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I have a formula that I have developed for calculating the ideal bill rate uh, and the formula is as follows. Um, take, you know, for a, for a new employee, uh, take that employee's uh, salary that you're about to offer. Um, and, and even if it's fixed salary, you can divide it by 2080 to get that hourly number. Uh, and again, if it's $40 an hour, um, get your overhead factor, which I already talked about how to get the overhead factor. Expenses for the last 12 months divided by the payroll for the last 12 months. Get that overhead factor for your company. Multiply that pay rate with overhead factor and then further multiply it by 1.2, at least 1.2, because you want to make, you want to shoot for 20% profit. Um, and when you shoot for 20% profit, you'll probably land somewhere between 10 and 15%. If you shoot for higher, obviously higher profit, but let's say you want to make 20% profit. So multiply that by 1.2. That is the ideal bill rate. Then look at your fee schedule for the similar skilled employees and see whether the other skilled employees are being billed at that rate uh, or is this going to be too much or is it going to be too little? So it's very important that you understand that when you hire someone and you are offering a salary rate to them, you're also at the same time defining their billing rate. Uh, Now, many companies, tell me, many owners tell me, but Shafat, we hardly do any hourly billing. So why are you focused on the hourly bill rate when we don't do any hourly billing? Uh, The difference uh, is not about whether you bill the client on an hourly basis. It is about understanding that you are charging the project at that rate. Then the project would charge the client. In many cases, it's a direct pass-through between what you charge the project and what the project charges the client. And the pass-through, direct pass-through is typically on an hourly project. But in some cases, it's not a direct pass-through where it's a fixed fee project where your employees are charging the project so much and then the project charges the client. So always think of your employees as if they were outside consultants and they're working on the project. So they are going to charge that much money to you irrespective of what you build to the client. So you need to make sure that you know what that ideal bill rate is for that employee and you budget your projects so that you are hitting that target rate. Uh, and, and of course, in, in Bill Quick, we have this employee performance uh, um, section where we bring in those KPIs and you can run it for last year, this year, last 12 months compared to the last previous 12 months. And I'll show you those KPIs that you need to monitor for your employees. You know, what is their percentage of their uh, billable hours compared to non-billable hours? So basically a term called utilization rate. Are you utilizing your team well or your employee well? And then what is the revenue that you made out of the employee and how many hours was that that he got paid? And therefore, what is the realization rate for that employee? And how does that compare with the target rate that you had set for the employee? Is it higher or lower? 
and and if it's lower then into the regions about why it's lower you know was it you moved him into marketing for the company and therefore it's not fair for him to meet that target rate anymore because he's he's now working on the overhead activities of the company so he should be measured differently so all of those things are available to you with a good product out there and there are many that will do a good job uh, in in doing that but for any owner to pick the rate arbitrarily or because oh, we've been billing this draft you know our drafting person at 80 bucks an hour for years therefore we're going to stick to that 80 bucks an hour <clears throat> so they, that's a big mistake don't do that use the math to calculate that accurately and understand the data. Of course, you uh, if you've been in business for many years, you have that data. Last but not the least, big mistake that owners make, in, especially in architectural firms, um, more with architects than any other industry, is they hardly revise their fee structure. Um, so make that an annual process in your company. Every December, the principals should meet and look at their fee schedules and bump up their rates by 3% to 5%. And trust me, your client will not complain. And cost of living goes up, cost of doing business goes up. Therefore, you're not really increasing the rate or increasing your profit. You're just simply preventing from the profits being taken away from you because of the cost of business going up. So definitely look into doing that, um, you know, once a year at least, uh, if not twice a year, uh, to catch up with the new rates. And yes, you know, if you feel you're going to be uh, not competitive with the other, other uh, companies, you might as well lose those clients that don't appreciate your work at that rate, uh, because you don't want those clients that are price sensitive to that segment. It'll hurt too much. So, uh, thank you for sharing that very concise summary of uh, you know how to calculate the billing rate. I, I just want to add one thing to your formula there, Shafat, if I may. Sure. So this is something that um, I know a lot of architects may do um, may do wrong, and so I want to point out when you get that final number, when you have, and since you know math, you'll get this. Um, you know, when you have that final number, you have the the number that you're paying your employee. You multiply it by the overhead rate, so you get this inflated number. Let's say it's a hundred. And then you want to fit, you want to tack your profit onto that. You actually need to divide by 100 minus 100% minus the percentage that you want to have as your as your profit. I'm going to give you an example. So if you want to get 20% profit, you actually have to divide or multiply by 0.8 or divide by 80% because what's that's going to give you? I forget the strange mathematical term, but you see Correct. what I'm saying, right? Because if you have a hundred dollars and you and you uh, you multiply that by 1.2. You're gonna get what? You're gonna get a uh, 120, right? But that only gives you 20 is only 16.6 percent .6 of uh, above 100. See what I'm saying? That's true. Yep, that's true. So, so I, yeah, you you would you would actually divide by 0.8. You're right um, to get the actual multiplier or actual number, which would be a little higher than 120. So absolutely yes. So your profit is not 20 percent at 120 if your cost is 100. Uh, because it's high, it's 20 of 120, so it's not exactly 20%. There we very go. Ho point. Hopefully our audience handled that, uh, you yeah. know, were able to catch that. Maybe they'll go back and listen to that again. But, you know, that just points to something that um, that is so important that I, I love that you're bringing up here, is that the, really the numbers are important, you know. And um, do you have any last thoughts or last words on that that you want to end with before we before we end our conversation here? Knowing that majority of your audience is architects, I want to give a couple of tips to the architects that I've seen um, they often miss on. Uh, number one is don't start a project without a retainer. And, and the best way to calculate the retainer would be your average monthly billing. So if you are going to work on a project for six months and you're going to bill $10,000 a month, ask for a $10,000 retainer because it's the last month that the client might disappear or something might happen and you already invested a month worth of time in it and you're not getting your final invoice paid and you're going to lose that ten thousand dollars if you don't have a retainer so apply that retainer to the final invoice number two track your marketing efforts towards the project and put that time and expense into the project not into some other bucket where it's a black hole and you have no idea 
so that your true profitability from the day you started chasing the project and you won the project and all the efforts, the RFQ and the RFP and meeting with the client is tracked, even though it's non-billable, is tracked as a true cost. So give yourself a true profitability picture rather than that half profitability picture, especially for small projects. That can be significant amount of uh, the money that you spent or time you spent on the project by winning it. Um, number three, if you are going to provide free services to your client, and often people do, uh, hey, I'm going to meet with you, uh, you know, uh, talk about your potential home that you're going to buy or design, and I'm going to spend this time with you and guide you or the office space you're going to move into. I'll give you some space planning ideas, whatever that is. Any free service you provide to the client, invoice them and provide the value of the invoice. At the bottom, say discount 100%. Thank you for your business. What that does is the client then appreciates what you did. Uh, if you never send that invoice for no charge services, they will never know what you did for them. And they will think that this is, this is something that you will do for them often. And if they do it two, three times, they keep making changes to the design. You you did the first one free. You did the second one free. The third one, you start charging. You say, you know what? I gave you two free. Now they understand, yes, he did. You know, So these are the three things that I wanted to share that I see architecture firms often stay away from retainers. They often um, are not tracking their marketing time and they often shy away from billing their services when they're providing free services. And the client knows he's not gonna be, get charged, but the client doesn't know what the value of that free charge was. Was it a $200 worth of service or was it a $2,000 worth of service that was provided free? Let the client know what it was uh, by sending that $0 invoice at the end. Now, if our listeners, I know I do get a lot of listener questions about, about ArchiOffice. Uh, which program should they go with? What can you tell us about ArchiOffice versus uh, BillQuick? Which one would be right for my listeners? And where do they go to start that conversation with your company? ArchiOffice by far fits majority of the architectural firms. Um, it is not a full accounting software. It uh, does the business management aspect of it, essentially time tracking, expense tracking, billing, project management, and business intelligence. <clears throat> so for your accounts payable, as an example, or your standard financial statements, uh, or your bank reconciliation, you would use something like QuickBooks that we integrate with. So, but nine out of 10 businesses that we look at, that's all they really need. The, the accounts payable is a once a month task, their accountant does it, but project managers, you know, rank and file employees, they all need fill timesheets and all of that. So we serve that purpose well, the project management aspect of it and billing. Um, so nine out of 10 architects would be very happy with ArchiOffice. Now, a notch above ArchiOffice would be BillQuick because it has that full accounting integrated with it. So it does the accounts payable, it does the uh, bank reconciliation, it does the financial statements, um, and it's all integrated. So uh, so when you are employees are filling their expense sheet, it will cut the checks for them without you having to rekey any of that. They'll pull that expense sheet if it's approved and figure out what the reimbursables were and get them the check for the reimbursables. So both products are great uh, depending about your needs. If your business wants a one integrated solution that uh, does the, all of this in one solution, then go with BillQuick. But if you already have something like QuickBooks, you wanna stay with that for your AP, uh, and you want to use uh, something that's a front-end application that every employee can use, then ArchiOffice is the best solution. And it's a web-based product. <clears throat> you can be up and running literally in a couple of days or even sign up for a trial and, and play with it. Right. And to get a trial, go to ArchiOffice.com. That'll take you right there. There's a big button on the screen. You can sign up for a trial. You can sign up to attend one of the, uh, the demos. I know Steve Burns a lot of times runs those. Yes, he does the Archie Office demos every uh, Wednesday, I believe, um, and he still does it personally because he's so passionate about about the product and the industry. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the business of architecture. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I hope you know it was it was all uh, useful to your listeners. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect. Get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. 
The sponsor for today's show is Arch Breach, the client relationship management tool built specifically for architects. If you want to systematize your marketing and business development, Arch Breach will help you do it. Visit archreach.com to learn more. Expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.